Welcome to Cybe Stories, Adam. It's so great to have you with me today. Thanks for having me. So the listeners know a bit about who you are, Adam. Why don't you be, why don't we begin here by you telling us a little bit about yourself, perhaps where you live, what you do, um, and your, your ministry. Yeah. So my name's Adam. I live in North Carolina currently. I kind of grew up in a military home. So I, uh, yeah, I endured 20 years of my dad going through the military, uh, but he ultimately retired on the East Coast. And so now I live here. Um, so currently I teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and uh, that's a, it's a pretty uh, rewarding process getting to see people grow up and train and develop themselves. And um, yeah, actually before that, I actually did have a few um, amateur fights in the, in the cage for those that are familiar with MMA. Uh, so I've pretty much done the fighting on all three fronts, <laughs> whether it's spiritual, mental, or actually physical. Wow. Uh, and currently I run the Curious Christianity YouTube channel and uh, soon to be podcast will be coming out. Well, let's get into your story, Adam. Tell us, you said you're from a military family. Where were you born? Uh, what was that family life like? And was God any part of your family life? Yeah, so I was born actually in Oregon on the West Coast, and pretty much we lived all up and down the entire West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and then ultimately Hawaii, and then my dad retired in Virginia. Uh, kind of growing up in a military household, a military family can be a little bit hard because you don't have that consistency of friendships, school, and all those things. So um, I did grow up in a Christian home, but kind of the loneliness and, and the struggles of almost experiencing a type of abandonment with my own dad, even though he was a tremendously loving father, and I really couldn't put it any better that he was super ideal in so many ways, there's still just a way that you kind of disconnect. Uh, no matter what it is you, you try and stuff, there kind of ended up being abandonment issues there for me. Um, but my mother actually tells a story of me being about four years old. And she said that, you know, there was this moment where she was explaining kind of the gospel and Christianity to me. And then she asked me to pray and she really felt like I really was understanding and taking it in. And so we prayed there in the car. And so that is the moment that she actually considers me to basically get saved. Uh, and that's kind of the early earliest point that I can reference. But I will say um, I have a specific memory of being even seven years old and praying to the Lord and, and talking to God on the playground. And so it really was kind of a part of my life through throughout most of my young years. In moving all of those places, did you... Were you active in any kind of a church or community? It seems like it would be hard moving from place to place to really be connected. It was hard, but we were always a part of church wherever we went. And even if you were just in a place for a little while, we were always visiting churches. Um, I really can't remember. There wasn't ever really a long stint in which we weren't in church on Sundays. And when we actually did live in areas, we were often there, you know, the two, three times a week, Sundays, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Church was very much a huge part of, of my life. Um, Awana, every every kind of thing you can imagine, helping take down chairs and, and all those sorts of things. So uh, church was just, uh, that was part of our lifestyle. Mm, it was yeah. always there, always present. Perfect. So, and, and it, I'll tell you one other thing that was really interesting because it was such a small moment, but I remember uh, getting up early, early one morning. My dad usually left for work before we got up when I was really young, but I do remember him having a Bible on the table one time and reading reading the Bible before breakfast. Mm. So that was just kind of one of those seminal moments of, of kind of actually seeing my dad take time out for his own devotions before going to work. So it kind of stuck with me. Yeah, so it seems then in a sense that your parents really – it was a real part of their life that they invested in. They lived, it sounds like they tried to live out. And, um, but you, you mentioned that your father was a, a good father, but yet there was a sense of abandonment. Was that emotional or physical? I mean, was it that he was gone a lot because of his military service or 
um, what, what did that surround? Yeah, it really was. It was because he was gone sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. He would be gone for three, four months at a time. And I don't know what it is, but there's something just about being a child where you just can't, you can't really control, or I'm not really sure how to, how to handle that. Right. And so it just ended up being a disconnect emotionally. And I didn't even realize it myself until I was in my later Mm twenties. So it wasn't until later that I even recognized there was anything there. So, yeah, yeah sometimes I, I think growing up in childhood, you just absorb the world that you're in and then it's all of its bits. And, um, you know, that's, that's your norm, normal, that's your reality. And you don't really realize the implications perhaps until later. But so as a child, it sounds like you, you had a, a real or um, sincere kind of belief in God, that you prayed to God on the playground. He was a, a real part of your life in that sense. As you were growing older into teenage years, did that kind of sense of belief or um, appreciation for God or your faith continue? Did it grow or what happened? Yeah, yeah. No, so God was always a part of my life, it seemed like. Um, no matter what I did, he always seemed to be a huge part of my life. And even growing up in my teenage years, becoming, you know, 15, 16, all those years. um, Now, the major struggle that I really ended up struggling with was a type of depression. Mm -hmm. I struggled with serious loneliness because of all of the changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were homeschooled mostly. um, And that just, that was, it was good and bad in some ways, right? It was good because of the constant changing of areas. So we always could just bring our school with us and you didn't have to worry about changing schools and then adapting entirely new to environments. But it was rough in the sense of socialization, right? There are just certain stents where, you know, I remember when we lived in Hawaii and throughout that time, you know, we were just starting to kind of put down roots, but we were only got to stay for one year and then boom, we we're off to the next place. And so that was incredibly difficult, incredibly hard. Um, So, but when I turned like 15, 16, I really became a part of a co-op, which is like a homeschool group full of other homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And that actually became incredibly influential and incredibly important. Um, Now, during some of this section, as I was starting to even gain friends, I did. I struggled with some serious depression and contemplations of suicide and those things. And I've always very much attributed, I I've attributed my life very much to, to God in the midst of all of that. I was struggling through it, but I was constantly praying to God in that process. And I was praying to God for friends and, uh, and the Lord brought them around. And those friends ended up being actually some of the friends that I still have today. Uh, so my, my best friend, Titus, was um, kind of one of the major ones I met at the co-op right there. And so him and I have been friends uh, uh, for over 20 years now. And wow. um, he's, you know, just absolutely been one of the hugest parts of my life. And and shout out to Chase as well, who I uh, kind of first met there um, all those years ago. And so, you know, the Lord did. He answered my prayers. And he so, brought about some friendships then really was impactful. So. That, wow. That, so God showed up, you know, sometimes, he did. He did. Um, you know, during those periods of isolation and depression, it's either, it's easy to, just as easy to push away from God and saying, you know, why is my life like this and questioning and uh, doubting, but it sounds like he, he really provided for you during that time. Well, and you know what? I feel like if I didn't have God, I don't know if I would have made it because there would have been no hope. Like I I had hope that God would bring something around and I constantly, yeah, cried out for, for that help. Mm -hmm. Um, And there were very much times of temptation, but, but yeah, I very much had a a real hope um, in God. So. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, but it, it is good. <laughs> I know you're sitting there before me and I'm sure our listeners are going, well, okay. So he believed in God. Great. <laughs> and God provided, but, but I'm, but, but you had mentioned to me that, that there were periods in your time where you had really pushed away. What made the turn for you to move from this kind of, you know, belief in a God who cared and who showed up mm-hmm. and who was real to, to pushing away from that? 
So the real challenge came after high school. So after high school, um, we were on the East Coast, and personally, I hated the East Coast. If you've ever been to the West Coast or the East Coast, the West Coast is far superior in beauty. <laughs> um, and of course, I had all these wonderful childhood memories. So I decided that I wanted to go back to the West Coast. Um, so finished high school, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, you know, everyone's like, well, go to college. And I was like, what for? Like, I don't, there wasn't anything I wanted to study. There wasn't anything I was passionate enough about to just launch into college. So I called up my grandparents and said, hey, um, I want to come and basically hang out and stay with you guys for a while and kind of maybe figure things out, maybe start for myself an entirely new life on the West Coast, you know, hadn't really figured out what I wanted to do. And they were very surprised, but very welcoming. They're like, okay, yeah, sounds great. And so I kind of set off on my journey. But part of that journey was I wanted, I decided for myself that I would decide if this Christianity thing was my faith or if it was just going to be the faith of my parents. See, growing up, I grew up with it. I believed it. I felt like I had a relationship with God, but I had never seriously challenged it, mm. right? All of my friends were Christians. I mean, I of course, I had met some non-Christian friends uh, and had some of those. But for the most part, my life was very insulated and sheltered like most people would suspect of a Christian homeschooler, right? So um, I got over there and I got to spend about six to eight months there. And uh, my grandparents, uh, they live on top of basically a hill or a very large mountain hill sort of thing. So it's isolated away from the world. You know, civilization is almost an hour away, right? And when you go to Bob's Market, you actually talk to Bob, that sort of thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, yes. normally you're, it's not the same thing. So I would far removed from the rest of civilization. And so it's here that I decided like, okay, yeah, I, I want to see what else is out there. Why, why do people leave Christianity? Why is, is Christianity true? Is the virgin birth true? Like what, what is going on? Where did Cain get his wife? Where did, I mean, every question you can imagine, I wanted to answer all of the hard questions. And so I, I kind of began my journey. I was looking at atheist forums. I was listening to their questions. I was listening why people left Christianity. I went down to the Mormon church. I went to the Catholic church, the Seventh-day Adventists, listened to Muslims. I was listening to anybody who would tell me why they left Christianity, why Christianity was false, why their faith was true. And so this, um, this was an intensive process. I was spending four to six hours easy on, on this every single day, pretty much. Mm. Um, and as a result, I picked up something interesting as well. And I had no idea that my grandpa was well-educated, <laughs> to be honest. He never, I never really talked to him growing up. Pretty much like when we were kids, we would kind of see him. He would just kind of come home from work and sleep. And that was it. So um, I began to kind of ask him things or whatever and began to find that he knew a lot of stuff. Um, see, at the time, I was very much a rationalist. I was only willing to believe in things that I could understand. And so he presented Christianity and answered my questions in a way that was very different than maybe some other people had experience. He didn't tell me what the answers were. I would ask him, hey, what about this? And he would kind of say, well, look, here, here are the ways that some people get to this answer. And here are these answers over here. And he was giving me the answers from the Bible or truths or explanations from different things, but he wasn't handing it to me and just telling me, this is the answer, ignore everyone else. He gave me different reasons for different things. He gave me why skeptics believe this, why Christians believe this. And he gave me the freedom to choose for myself. He never told me you have to believe this or you have to believe that. Mm. And I very much have thought that if it wasn't for him handling me in this way, that I, I very likely would have become an atheist uh, because 
I was very truth oriented. And at this point, I did not care at all about personal experience arguments from other people. Anyone that shared their testimony, I just could care less. I wanted the objective truth. What is real and objective beyond anyone's personal opinion or experience? And so it was a long process. And I also had like a few of my uncles, I was asking, <laughs> I was asking uncles, cousins, uh, and other church goers. I was that annoying guy. You did not want to talk to in church at the time, <laughs> uh, because guess what? If you said something wrong, I was about to show you where your, your logic went wrong. And, um, yeah, it was a, it was a rough time for those around me in some ways, but that's all I was doing. I was constantly writing notes on paper and asking questions. And every new question I had, I was asking everyone around me. And uh, for me at the time, Christianity was very much one whole piece. And that's really, really important and significant because at this point, I very much felt like if there was a question that was an objection to Christianity and I could not answer it, I would reject Christianity. I would turn my back on the whole thing. And I was, I was prepared to do that. Um, but at the end of this six to eight months, I, uh, I became compelled to think that it was true. Christianity was true. And I think that it was also very important to me that I also felt a sense of the Holy Spirit with me at times. And so there was a combination of personal experience and answering the questions that I had. Um, the Christians had, they have answered the questions very well as to what I was wondering about and gave me plausible explanations. So at that point, I had believed that Christianity was true. And that was my first uh, major challenge to Christianity. So I did have a second one in my, um, in my 20s. Yeah. And before we go there, I, I think it's a very important, well, a few things to draw out there. First of all, is that you had a, a conception that it was a rather all or nothing enterprise. Mm -hmm. That if, if you, it's like the Jenga tower, if you pull out yes. one, one piece of the puzzle and it collapses, then the whole thing is, is worthless R rather than looking at, um, looking at that there might be, you know, some areas that there weren't completely Cer certain in terms of answering or, you know, that might provide a little bit of doubt, but yet the, the whole of the structure is still supported. It's still pretty foundational, um, uh, supported foundationally, but, but yet you were in an all nothing, all or nothing mentality. I'm curious as you were, um, looking at other faith and religions, I would imagine that they had their own Jenga towers and they had mm -hmm. their own areas of weakness um, and mm -hmm. that were causing doubt or, or suspicion. Um, were you in that you were in your honest search? Did they have holes in, in the, or in their foundation or were there particular things that you just said, okay, I've looked at um, Islam and that's not it. Mm -hmm. Or I've looked at Mormonism or I've looked at whatever. Were there more doubts as you look looked at those than there were at Christianity. I mean, the way that it sounds is that you didn't find any holes or doubts or problems with Christianity as you were searching and looking at it more closely. Yeah. So, so I want to be as charitable as possible, but here was the thing I literally did. I went down to the churches and I talked and argued about like some of the major holes or points in these other faiths. I remember a couple different conversations, one at the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I brought up some of the issues of their dietary laws and dietary thoughts. And one of the issues in Seventh-day Adventism, they believe in the traditional Jewish diet, right? Well, I read what Paul says in the New Testament. And he says, um, oh, what's he talking about here? He's talking about the food and dietary laws. And I know and I'm sure on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that nothing in and of itself is wrong to eat quoted that verse to the guy and he's like well you got to read it from its original context and i said okay cool so we started from the beginning of the passage read the whole thing and then he just kind of sat back and said well but there's all these health benefits and it was like clear that i was like dude i'd like this is a major slam on your entire your entire system here and he just decided to ignore it and i was like yep yeah, so 
I poked holes in, in all of his stuff and he didn't have any reasonable answer to me at the time. And then we went to the Mormon church and I poked holes in a bunch of stuff that they had brought up. And so I was, I was finding significant holes. These, these ideas of Mormonism, how it came about, almost certainly that Joseph Smith was, you know, a charlatan and a manipulator. Like there were constantly big holes in each one of these. Now, I will say, if you talk to apologists in any of these fields today, um, they're much stronger than what I encountered back then. So I'm not at all going to say that like, oh, that's just so easy to poke holes exactly in each one of them today. Um, but it was very significant. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, seem to poke holes in so many of these ones. And I thought of each of their faiths as well as pretty monolithic. That it's just a matter of if I could poke holes in your faith, I wasn't going to believe it. I wasn't going to hold on to it, you know? And so I felt like I was getting way more answers from the Christian side. And those that I talked with on the other sides, they weren't really presenting me with anything significant. So. Hmm. Hmm. And even all of those online discussions or, or presentations from atheists or skeptics, those weren't convincing for you either. It sounds like as com when oftentimes, you know, atheists are pushing back pretty hard and they can be mm -hmm. very rhetorically, you know, compelling and per mm -hmm. persuasive, but it sounds like the, the due diligence that you were conducting with regard to the Christian perspective, you felt like that was more firm or more solid and more truthful, I guess you could say, than what you were finding from the naturalistic side. Yeah, I just wasn't finding any significant arguments that weren't, at the time, pretty much sufficiently answered. Um, you know, they were giving arguments as like, oh, well... Maybe the virgin birth wasn't real because in Isaiah, there isn't really a word for virgin and it's just young maiden and all these things. But ultimately, like there seemed to be very plausible, very reasonable Christian answers to these objections. Atheism didn't really posit anything positive. It only takes crack shots at Christianity, right? But it doesn't really offer you something to grab onto. Um, now, that was enough, though. Like, if atheism was going to be able to point out contradictions, sure, it was going to cause me to leave Christianity. I was very much focused on the arguments. The intellectual arguments were everything to me back then. Mm. Um, now, I will say, today, I think very differently. I think that there's a lot to be said for personal experience. Um, but back then, none of it really mattered. I, I was, I wanted to remove the personal experiences from the arguments as much as humanly possible. Yeah. It sounds so. like you were trying to be as intellectually honest as you possibly could in that search. And then yeah. you, you landed in a place of confidence uh, that Christianity was mm -hmm. true. You said until your twenties and then yes. something happened. Yes. So then we hit uh, my early twenties and the new wave of atheism had just been starting to hit much more mainstream, more prominent. You know, the Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Michael Shermer, all these guys were coming on the scene. There were very few apologists back then. I really only remember a couple. Um, and so that really got me into listening to all of this stuff because See, I was a rationalist. I only was willing to believe what I could understand. And at the time, Christianity had answered all of the questions that I had. Right. But now came the new wave of atheism, and they were asking new questions. Mm. And I was very, very seriously hunting down the answers as rapidly as possible. What, like what, what, what kind of questions were the new, the new atheists asking at the time? Do you remember? There were a lot because pretty much, you know, for instance, talking about the beginning of the universe, could the universe be eternal? It's like, oh, well, if the universe is eternal, that sounded like a very good objection to me against Christianity. You know, the universe is eternal, therefore it's always existed, therefore it has no need of God, and God also could not have created it, right? 
So that sounded like a very strong objection to me. Um, and of course, you know, I felt like William Lane Craig's cosmological argument was a very strong answer to this, this type of objection. And for me, the philosophical arguments were very, very powerful. You know, the idea that time cannot be infinite in the past, that was a very strong refutation of this type of eternal argument. Um, the moral argument, right? Or, or is morality actually subjective or objective? Or how does, what about the problem of evil? Absolutely, those were very serious objections. And then, honestly, there are a lot of other, there are a lot of other objections that um, are very, very intricate. So I was thinking about all sorts of the the interesting arguments or questions, such as, um, does God love those people in hell? Like, is it possible for God to love people in hell? Um, or arguments such as, is there free will in heaven? Right? So the idea of free will, how does free will tie in with um, morality? If we don't have free will, then is God a moral monster? Um, so like a lot of these questions were all coming up to me and I was eager to answer all of them. But the thing I was noticing, of course, is that after a few years of trying to answer every single objection that anyone can come up with, um, I was getting tired. <laughs> Like it was exhausting because for me, the answers were more important. They were more important than simply, oh, now I have an answer for this. No, it was about my salvation and faith as a whole because I still had a very glass ceiling view of Christianity. Christianity was all or nothing. If an atheist cracked this and showed that there was a serious Bible contradiction, I was like, okay, that's it. Like Christianity is false. And now, of course, I look at that as almost absurd. Like, oh, if there's one Bible contradiction, it destroys everything. Um, but yeah, I was answering, yeah, Bible objections, contradictions in the Bible, you know, difficulties. What does this mean? What does that mean? Yeah, I was trying to reconcile all of those things. Were you doing this independently or were you still in community trying to ask other people and, and try to absorb information from a kind of a sound community? Or, or were you trying to wrestle through everything on your own? Yeah, I mean, um, in community in a way, um, but... I only had a few few people I could talk to about stuff like this. Yeah. Um, one actually was still my grandfather at the time. I would call him periodically and be like, hey, hey, so so-and-so saying this, like, what? How, how do you answer this? How do you respond to this? Um, some were a few other friends. Um, you know, the vast majority of my friends are not or were not even, you know, apologists or anything. Like I said, at the time, there were very few. Mostly what I was doing was I was consuming a ridiculous amount of YouTube. You know, I watched, you know, pretty much every debate that William Lane Craig had out back then. Oh yeah, I'm watching, I'm listening to the objections and his answers, you know, and every time I found a new question, I'm looking for, okay, what's, what's the answer to this one and that one. And so, yeah, but other than that, this was largely independent. I'm, I'm doing all the research on my own. Um, listening to philosophers and punching in their questions online. So yeah, it was pretty independent. So through this process, you know, you, you, you expressed that it was tiring. Um, yes. But I wonder, was it starting to poke holes in your view of Christianity? Uh, was it causing doubt? Were any of these questions un seemingly unanswerable? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when when this when the standard is certainty in every mm -hmm. in every area that's a that's a very high bar so i wondered did your faith or belief start to crumble at all through this process in a sense yes or oh, i guess i would say i did have points of serious doubts right when when i would run into a question and the answer was not easily available Right. I'm looking at and like going like, okay, okay. Like this seems like, this seems like a problem. Right. Um, one example would be, you know, the arguments from God's incomprehensibility. It's the idea or, or you could say that 
God is logically incoherent. In other words, we always say that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Like he's all good, he's all powerful, he's all knowing. And that like there must and some people posit that there's some sort of logical contradiction here. And for me, that was very troubling at the, at the at the time. And I was like, okay, well, if that's true, then Christianity has to be false. And some of these things they would, right? So that's what I mean. Like when I would stay up at night and if a day went by where I didn't find the answer, oh yeah, it was bothering me. It's gnawing on me. The voice is just constantly nagging you. Hey, what about that? What about that? What about the doubts? What about, you know, this question that you don't have the answer to? And so that's why it was so tiring because I felt like I had to find the answer. You know, it was um, it was just existentially kind of terrifying because I was struggling for meaning and purpose and struggling to to find the answers. And that's why it was a big difference is because I did. I felt like my entire salvation, life, meaning, purpose hung on finding the answer. So in other words, I felt like if I didn't have the answer, then my entire worldview, my entire life, would virtually be a lie. And having all of that hanging over your head while you're trying to find the answer is pretty much like having the guillotine hang over your head. And so my ability to find the answers was my only salvation. I was my own savior. If I couldn't find the answers, my faith was false and I was gonna leave. And then, of course, I was going to argue and fight with all of the other Christian apologists who espoused it to be true. And so it was um, it was a very serious, serious time for me. Yeah. Did you ever get to a point where you said in order to remain intellectually honest in this all or nothing kind of acceptance, rejection paradigm? Did you ever step back and say, I just can't believe that anymore because I can't answer these, you know, questions or, or did you kind of hang on by a thread as it were during those periods of doubt and, and not uh, leave Christianity altogether? Yeah. I will say that I made it to the cliff, but I never made it over the cliff. Mm. You know, one of the other ones that I want to mention in here a little bit is um, my brother. My brother is also uh, been a Christian. We've, we've both grown up together. And, uh, you know, when we were growing up, we both had, uh, devotions, Bible reading and stuff like that. That was part of our, uh, part of our homework in homeschool. And, uh, my mother had always prayed. She's like, you know what? The only thing that I really hope and pray for is that my two boys will grow up loving the Lord. And, uh, and we have, and that's been tremendously wonderful. But he's also, my brother has also been been somebody who's incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly helpful, and kind of helped keep me as well in some moments. And the, I think the other thing that makes all of this interesting, right, is that throughout some of these doubts and sufferings, I largely suffered alone. You know, I think it's one of the, the major struggles in Christian circles is that, especially back then, you can't struggle in public. You know, that's not a, a legitimate, it's not a legitimate thing. Most people, if you're doubting, then, well, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're going to be pushed out of the church, all those things. So I largely str- struggled and suffered in silence. Mm. Um, so, but the, oddly enough, the one who ended up helping me indirectly was my cre- friend, uh, Chris Arledge, uh, who is actually studying philosophy I think he's maybe finished his PhD now, but philosophy of science. And it was during a phone call conversation. And he had no idea what was going through and had no idea that his call would impact me so much. But um, he was just talking about the Bible, how what he was talking about, what his pastor talked about on Sunday. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, you just sometimes need to believe the Bible Uh, even if you can't always understand it, because if you want to only believe it when you can understand something or only believe God when you can understand something, then you have decided to put yourself as the number one authority. You've decided to put yourself above God and you're not willing to say, I'll accept something you say just because you say it. 
And when you make yourself above God, then all of the burden is on you. But if you admit that there is a higher authority, then you can put your faith in that higher authority, even if you can't entirely understand it. And when he said that, it clicked for me. I totally understood what he was saying. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I never thought of that or saw that before because skepticism was creeping in really, really hardcore in my life. But the truth about skepticism is that it's empty. And I was feeling that effect. I was feeling the black hole of the next question and the next question and the next question, you know, because every answer I got or every answer I gave had another question behind it. And it's just pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling you down the entire time. And my friend's answer helped me to understand that in order to make progress, you have to believe first. You believe in something, you believe in God, you trust in what God said, and then from there, you can move forward. And that was incredibly liberating. And it absolutely changed my entire Christian faith because then I no longer took Christianity as like, oh, if, if there's just one false contradiction, if there's just one missing element, my whole faith doesn't shatter. And so it very much put my faith with God in a realm where it became much more personal as well, because now I was putting my faith in the person and trusting Christ for the answers instead of trusting myself to find the answers. Hmm. And so uh, that was incredibly liberating. <laughs> I imagine that was a huge paradigm shift for you, particularly when you, like you say, truth is is truth in terms of an intellectual understanding of reality, but truth is also a person and mm -hmm. and is the person of Christ. No, no, I think in, in what you say right there is so important. Why right? do you, for, for, yeah, why do you say all, that? Yeah, for all of the eggheads out there, right? They're just like, no, 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 truth is about propositions. It's about claims and, and stuff like that, right? But Jesus comes and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's like, no, 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 truth, truth is a person. And there are deep truths that we can understand and experience, right? That are, yeah, they're beyond simply just, oh, propositions and words and stuff like that. You can actually get to know your savior in a personal way. And that is a truth. Your experiences with God are very legitimate ways of knowing truth. They're not illegitimate ways to come to know God. And so I think that just encountering God is one of the most essential ways. Like forget about just the arguments. You encounter God yourself, you experience God yourself, and then that can supersede all of your arguments. You know, someone can make all the arguments they want in the world for why we live in the matrix. But it, it's like, well, I experience life all around me right now. You know, that's a pretty powerful argument in and of itself. Yeah, it is. And it is. And I think I love too what you say. And I, and I think for the skeptic, for the one who's maybe listening in, you know, when you say there's a sense of where you have to believe and then understanding will follow. And I think mm -hmm. that, that is a real, there's a real truth to that when you open yourself to not only kind of the rational knowledge, but the experiential knowledge of, of Christ and, and the way that the Holy Spirit, I know those are very strong Christian concepts for, again, for the skeptic uh, or who might be listening, but there, it's hard to explain the, the amount of confidence that you can gain relationally from putting your trust in the one who is over all, uh, but I'm also thinking of the skeptic who's going, well, you, you know, there were holes in Christianity and, you know, you just decided that you just, that's what you've always known. That's, you know, that's what's comfortable for you. Granted, you didn't get a hundred percent, you know, certainty, but who does any, any worldview, but, uh, beside that, um, I can, I can imagine a skeptic pushing back on your story and on your on your journey saying, but, 
but there were holes and you weren't willing to fill them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you're just not wanting to, you know, go over the cliff and and become completely intellectually honest and become a, the courageous atheist, you know, who can see reality for what it is. Uh, How would you respond to someone like that? So there are a lot of different answers. One of the answers I want to give is actually an answer that I gave and I understand that this will not be satisfying to every skeptic, but to some, I had a friend who actually has deconverted and he's lost his faith pretty much. Okay. And so he's not in the atheist camp yet. And and this is not somebody who, you know, has just been like a baby Christian and then they lost their faith. Like it spent a lot of time in Christianity, very, very knowledgeable about all of these things. And so we had several discussions and we talked about, you know, Christianity and arguments. And eventually, though, at the bottom of it, you know, I was like, hey, look, I recognize there is nothing I could say to you. I cannot argue anything else to you um, for you to arrive at the truth because he's so skeptical of everything else. Like, there's no argument. And he he agreed. He's like, yeah, you're right. There isn't. There isn't anything you can tell me, right? Because he has tons of information. And so I said, I was like, okay, cool. But you believe in God. He still believes in God. And I was like, and God knows everything, right? And he's like, yes, he believes that. God knows everything, right? Even for the skeptic, if you believe that God exists, God knows everything there is. And that God is ultimately the supreme source of truth. So let's just say that somebody corrupted everything else that we know around us, the Bible, personal experience, whatever it is. Ultimately, God's the only one who can answer the question. So I said, fine then you go to God directly and get the truth. If he's the only one that has it, then the only one that can give it to you it is him. Go and ask him yourself. Go and ask him yourself. And I think that that's something that most skeptics that I've known are not actually honestly willing to do. Now, I know that there are some that they will, they're going to go ahead and proclaim, like, I have honestly done that and tried and all of those things. Um, And there's no way that I can directly speak to every individual story. But the one thing that I have seen is that every major skeptic I've encountered, they have their rules that they've created. And this is what I would say. Are you willing to let go of your rules as to what box God has to fit in? Because if God really does exist, then ultimately you would have to be willing to submit to whatever his rules are and not the rules that you've created as to what he has to fit into. Because if God exists, then he is what? The most loving, most compassionate, all-knowing, all-good, all-created one. And so it's no surprise that whoever the skeptic is, are you the most loving, compassionate person in the world? Most are willing to admit, well, no, I'm not. Yeah, well, God is. And so whatever the the answer to most of your quandaries is, I'm sure he has a much more loving, compassionate answer. And maybe he knows something you don't. So being willing to fully submit your ideas to what somebody else who is the ultimate authority has it's very liberating and freeing. Mm, yes. Like you say, it really does take the burden off of you and puts it to the source of, of all truth, knowledge and knowledge and love. Um, but I also, it, it's interesting in, in talking about, uh, you know, belief towards understanding and trust in a person. Um, I'm sure that there are those who are listening to who would, um, in a sense, in their skepticism, Um, they don't have all of the answers within their own worldview. You know, whatever that worldview is, apart from God, they have to make a lot of presumptions uh, for their worldview to be true. There's a lot that they don't know. You know, there are a lot of answers they don't know. They don't know, for example, how the universe came from nothing by nothing for no reason. Or, you know, they can't explain how things have the appearance of design, but there is no designer, Um, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, the thing is, um, how life started from non-organic life. There, there are a lot of holes 
in that Jenga tower, but yet there's a there's a degree of belief in that system, even though they don't have all of the answers either. Um, and so when Christians like you and I say, you know, we believe in a person that there is God and he's fully explanatory, um, there there is a, I guess you could say, a condescension towards, oh, you just believe, you just have faith that, um, but yet there's a faith component to even Godless worldviews. Um, mm-hmm. Can you speak to that for a minute um, in that just because a Christian says that they have belief or faith in God, even though they may not have all of the answers, that that is a legitimate way to view a worldview or trust in reality, um, because, that they are doing the very same thing. Yeah, no, it's so funny. Um, we all have our own blinders, you know, and, and so much of it falls into like confirmation bias and all those things. And even so for those that are skeptics and atheists, they're like, it was like, well, you're the one that has faith. You're the one that believes in all this other stuff. But it's like, okay, cool. How does science work? Like, did you do all of the scientific experiments? And it's like, well, no. Science is predicated on faith, right? Because even the scientists who do the work are basing their work on what? The guy who told them before them, right? You don't go back and repeat the same experiments. There's no escaping faith. Right. And it's like, oh, well, in Christianity, we have faith in people and what they told us from before. And we have faith in, to me, the one major thing that we have that everyone else doesn't have is we actually have faith in a God who who comes to bring revelation. But yeah, so all of the skeptics, they have faith in something else that's outside of them. And it's a matter of choice to some degree. What do you choose to put your faith in? Is it science? And is it because you have such faith in humanity that other human beings are telling you the truth? Because, you know, people are like, oh, well, science is obviously, you know, true or more ethical or believable because, oh, well, we can test it. Okay, that's, I understand, right? A lot of people will say, you can test it, you can repeat it. Did you test it? Did you repeat it? all of the scientific experiments that they told you about work? And of course the answer is no, right? They simply believe, you know, the books and they believe that the other people that came before them are telling them the truth. So there's no escaping it. Rather you believe in scientism or Buddha or any of those things, everybody has trust and faith because nobody, nobody can go back through and do all of the same things that have come before them so Mm. that's just it that's a very practical human aspect to life you have to put your faith and trust in something yes absolutely now you had characterized your earlier christianity as being monolithic a rather all or nothing kind of if Mm. there's a whole popped in the balloon the whole thing is is up up in the air right so but it sounds like you have a I don't know if matured is the right word, but advanced in the way that you perceive. So. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully all of us are in a period, you know, in a, in a time of growth as we understand our, our world and our worldview better. But it sounds as if it's not, it's no longer kind of an all or nothing proposition that um, in the Christian worldview that there is, I guess, what some would call a cumulative case. Mm-hmm. Um, that in, involves all, at, you know, so many different aspects of understanding reality, whether it's rationally or whether it's experientially, you know, through our knowledge or the person of Christ or though all of these things that put, that that work together in a in a cohesive kind of comprehensive way that seems to match with reality. That say you have, you know, your puzzle. Uh, you're missing a piece here or there because of a doubt. I'm not really sure how mm-hmm. like this piece over here works or that doubt. You know, I don't have an answer to that. But for the most part, you know, 90% of my puzzle is complete. I have seem to have a pretty con- comprehensive and understandable and intelligible view of the world and of myself, I, you know, and all of those things, how they all fit together. Would you say so that it doesn't feel as fragile um, it feels more confident, not certain, because, you know, again, in our own limited understanding, 
Uh, we'll never know everything in this life. Only God is omniscient, as you say. So um, how would you speak to the way that you view Christianity now um, as being confident, not certain, but it's not as fragile maybe as it once was? I'll put it this way, right? So it's like you you actually used a couple interesting terms like confident but not certain and all of those things. But there's a big difference between like having philosophical certainty, meaning like, oh, like mathematical proofs. But yeah, like I can be, I can be reasonably certain, right? And I mean that like justifiably certain. I'm certain and confident that um, that I'll see Jesus when I die, that I'll be resurrected again, that there is one God in heaven, you know, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And it's like, well, how can you know that? How can you have certainty, right? And that is a, that's a degree of faith, right? I have faith, I have belief, I have confidence though, right? So your faith is only as good as the object as it's placed in. And I believe that if God exists, right, then his character is something to have more, much more certainty than my own thoughts or mind. And so if I place all of the burden on what I know, what I believe to be true, well, then the burden is on me, right? But if I'm placing my trust in something outside of me that is greater than I am, that knows more than I am, who is more moral than I am, then I have a much stronger foundation. And it's almost puzzling to me as to why other people don't even see this issue of it's like, okay, everything that I believe and I must be able to understand it, that's what I'm going to be responsible for. And at first you might think it's like, well, that gives me lots of control. And it's like, it might, but have you ever thought about how finite you are? <laughs> Have you ever thought about how much you know? How, how much information do you have about the entire universe? Or let's just say just our galaxy. And I think if you stop and think about it, it's a very small amount of information. We as human beings understand very little as, as a whole. So I think you, you need to try and find the one true God and put your faith and trust in him. Uh, because I think that revelation is greater than wisdom. You know, wisdom is only as good as the presuppositions and the foundations upon which it's built. But when God reveals truth to us, then you should grab hold of it. So. Mm, yes. Thank you for that. Um, Adam, you have, you know, taken us on your your journey through skepticism and back. <laughs> Thankfully, you didn't go over the, the, the edge of the cliff, um, but it sounds like you've made it back to a very solid place um, where you're you're placing your trust in, in the one who actually can knows it and is truth and can reveal it. Is there anything else you'd like to add to your story before we kind of turn the page? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that honestly, one of the major things that I think is the most important is for anybody to have a personal relationship with God. You know, a personal relationship with God completely supersedes all of the arguments, all of the evidences, and it's the most immediate way that people actually do know God. If you're a skeptic and you're interested in evidence, you need to take that as a serious consideration, that the primary way you need to encounter God is go to him directly. Mm. So I, I think that that can supersede so many things you know somebody can give me evidence points for why something is true but if i experience it for myself you can blow right past everything else if if a, if a skeptic is listening right now and said okay all right adam um how do i experience god i mean what what, what would that look like even uh, how do i take steps in that direction to me the first thing is Treat God like a person. Just treat him like a person and, and talk with him. Like ask him, hey, Lord, you know what? I don't know if you exist. And be willing to just be open and honest. You know, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about the book of Psalms is David's honesty. He's complaining at God. He's yelling at God. He's frustrated with God. And he's like, are, are you even up there? Like David himself is like, 
you know, asking all these things. And I feel like for any skeptic, it's to be as honest as possible. And I'll tell you this as well, even so when I was going throughout my own journey, I also felt and noticed I wanted objectivity as much as possible, but I personally, I remember feeling resistance that there were all these different voices inside of my head and it became difficult to even discern well, what is objective, what is true. And so you do, you have to fight against, you know, other voices to try and get at the truth because the other voices, you know, yourself, your own voices in your own head will lie to you. And so you have to kind of counteract that and do your best to be as objective as possible and make honest, heartfelt pleas to God to try and connect with them. And then the second part that I think is super, super important, you have to be willing to sit down and listen to receive from them, to actually hear and know the, the truth that he does speak to you. Because the other thing that I've seen that's truly amazing is how many other people have walked away from God who can remember their encounters with God and they reject it now. They're turning away from their own experiences with God because they're like, no, but now these other evidences are so much better. And so they've even said, it's like, oh, I felt God once, but that wasn't really him. So mm. I'd be skeptical of your own skepticism. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and I know that there are so many stories. It's a common tale these days of Christians deconstructing. Um, yep. It sounds like you deconstructed without deconverting. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I actually have been called a deconstructionist. Um, I don't think it was a compliment at the time. But. No, no, I think it's, it, and there's been a very, um, I know that there have been people who've been trying to very, really clarify what that means. Deconstruction doesn't necessarily mean leaving faith. It's just taking, I guess, opening the box taking a look inside, seeing if it's worth a belief. Um, but oftentimes the path is towards deconversion, deconver you know, over the cliff if they can't find solid answers. The problem is, right, when you've built a pot incorrectly, right, and it hardens, there isn't really a way to make little adjustments, mm. right? So you, cut, you do, you have to destroy it, but then build it back up. Right. And if you do well with God, that's what he does sometimes with us. Right. Because the problem is we've built up our own religion as we want it and it's all messed up. And then there is there can be a need for us to kind of deconstruct our faith because we built it on poor foundations. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually have good godly foundations. And you know what? Sometimes it's because of our parents or pastors and they're all doing the best they can. But deconstructing your faith can be a good thing when you kind of built it in the wrong way. Right. And that, that was my problem was my foundation for my faith was built on rationalism. I built it on rationalism and it got pretty tall and it was, it was necessary to crumble that down. But now my foundation is Christ in a way that is so much greater than what it used to be. Yeah. It was reconstructed in a, in a yes. much more solid way. Yeah. And so you obviously have been on the edge of skepticism. You, you talk with skeptics. Uh, how can we as Christians engage with those who don't believe, who are skeptical of our beliefs? You've, you've hinted at a few mm -hmm. things. I, I know you, it sounds like you have um, very good and open and honest conversations with others. How can, um, how can we benefit from your wisdom in this area? I have two major things to say on this, and I'm, I'm passionate about this issue. Um, one, just because of my own stories and of course, of how many of people that I've seen, right. That have all deconverted, deconstructed. And part of the reasons I totally get it. And I feel like if I had been treated the, the way that they were treated, I would have left too mm. because of, you know, when you, yeah, let me get into this part. Okay. So number one, how you treat a person is you need to look at them very individualistically. Uh, people are very different. And I was, I was shocked and amazed to realize 
And so I was studying apologetics and everyone wants to know in Christianity, what's the best argument for God's existence? And that completely depends. That depends on the individual. Some people are focused on science. Some people are history people. Some people are philosophy people. Some people are pragmatic and some people are experiential. And so depending on the person, the arguments look entirely different. But the one thing that I want to add in here that I feel like I haven't seen enough is for people to understand how to love intellectuals. Mm. All right. So they're honest skeptics and they're kind of dishonest skeptics where they're not really looking for a serious conversation. They're just poking questions to make fun of you or mock you. But then there are those who are honest skeptics where the answers really, really matter to them. And I want you to picture this. Imagine that somebody comes into your church and you're the first one to greet them. And you can see that they are noticeably distraught and upset and everything like that. And you ask them, hey, what's what's the matter? And they tell you, it's like, my dad just died like yesterday. And I'm really, really having a hard time um, with it. It's really, really bothering me. And I'm even struggling in, with my faith and how to respond to God. And the first words are your, out of your mouth are, well, you shouldn't struggle with that. You just need to have more faith. Almost everybody realizes how unbelievably absurd that is to give a response like that. How can you be so cold? How can you be so callous? That is exactly how it feels for an intellectual to come into a church and ask you, where did Cain get his wife? And you just say, you just need to have more faith. Mm. Because the question for them is personal. The question itself is personal. And so just sitting there and listening to their question and saying, that's a really good question. Let me help you find an answer for that. It's caring for them. But to give them dismissive answers, you are indirectly telling them, I don't care what you think. I don't think your question is important, and I don't care that you think about it. That's what you're telling them. You're being uncompassionate. So for those that are honest skeptics, be patient with them, listen for their questions, seek to answer them. Yeah, it's amazing what how a little bit of valuing the other goes such a long way. You know, when, when you listen towards understanding and you're, you're really paying attention to the things that are really on someone's mind and on their heart, it, it's, it's, it's incredible how that will produce um, an openness in them. You know, mm-hmm. when you, when you care to listen, like you say, it's, it seems like a very simple little thing, um, like, oh, that really would matter with them, but it matters a great, great deal, you know, whether or not someone even will consider Christianity based upon how we respond to others, whether we put them off or we actually sit down as you did and spend, mm-hmm. you know, spend time with someone. And what a beautiful story that is. And Adam, you have brought so much today you're you're not you know the classic i was an atheist now i'm a christian but you're i love i love the way the struggle because i think that practically speaking is where we find a lot of people are right now just kind of looking at christianity all or nothing kind of thinking and and leave it behind but they don't really know you know they may know what they're rejecting but they may not know exactly what they're embracing in a worldview Mm -hmm. without god and um I think you you brought such a beautiful wholeness to your story, not only that you ended up reconstructing your faith, um, but that it wasn't onerous upon you. You know, you you really found the source of truth and and the one who reveals truth to you. Um, and I and it's obviously changed your life and, and you're helping other people to find Jesus as well. So thank you so much for coming on and and being so honest through your doubts and through your skeptical journey. I think it will be so helpful to many people out there listening today. Well, I hope so. Thanks so much for having me, Jenna. Uh, It was a great pleasure being here.